strategies and associated policies and they are making historically and in present times placing people at the center currently she is working as a lecturer at monash university malaysia she is the author of community radio policies in south asia a deliberative policy ecology approach published by palgrave macmillan in the year 2020 she is also a vice chair uh, of the global media policy working group of the international association for media and communication research today she is going to talk about the imperative of conducting critical critical policy ethnography drawing uh, on ethnographic field work which she has conducted across four uh, countries of south asia using a deliberative policy ecology approach so it is the real pleasure to have you dr preeti ragnath ma'am with us on this fdp uh, she would be speaking for around uh, 40 to 45 minutes and then we will get uh, 15 10 to 15 minutes uh, for the question answer round so please give a warm welcome to our distinguished speaker dr preeti ragnath what to you ma'am thank you so much uh, dr wasim for that very warm introduction a very good afternoon to all of you all the participants here uh, well it's such an honor and pleasure to be part of this uh, <clears throat> fdp also because uh, one of the co organizers that is jnu is an alma mater of mine i did my masters at jnu and it's wonderful to be uh, in the midst of so many colleagues and friends here so thank you very much for the opportunity uh what i will be doing today um as uh, was stated in my introduction i work on media policies in south asia so uh, given my background in international relations and politics and my interest in communication and media studies i use my phd as an opportunity to bring together my interests in both these areas and i've been able to conceptualize a methodology which focuses on uh, conducting policy research so before i share my screen uh, just to sort of break the ice and to uh, ease you a little bit into policy studies i just wanted to understand when you think of policy what is it that you think of i mean what is policy according to you and how does one go about researching it from your uh, perspective so if uh, you had a class assignment or if you were giving a class assignment uh, to students asking them to study any policy that you know Uh, is present in uh, you know in society that is uh, operational in society uh, how would you go, expect them to go about studying it uh, the i mean if you can use the chat or even raise your hand uh, we can sort of get an understanding of what people think of policy and how we can possibly study it any answers on what is policy okay the chat is open this can be any policy it could be economic policies it could be social policies uh, it could be policies related to the media and technology which are so i mean with so many of these policies that are uh, currently being rolled out it could be about blockchain and cryptocurrency whatever it is i mean it could be about uh, broadcast policies um but so this is the large basket of um policy activities that are prevalent by the government i mean we have dedicated um a vision that's right so we have a dedicated i mean we have various ministries that are functional to take charge of policies of different areas and ambits of life right and are being today and it, as uh, all of you know earlier we had the planning commission and now you have the niti aayog this is of course in the indian context but what i'm planning to do today is to sort of take you beyond this institutionalized understanding of policy to help you think about policy in uh, and drawing on the previous session which was so wonderfully led uh, in terms of experiences um and therefore this is an invitation for all of you to open up uh, your understanding of policy as not just a policy document so when i ask what how would you go about studying a particular policy uh, the idea was to try and see how you think about it right a lot of times we think about policies as policy documents we think about it in the form of legal clauses and uh, legal uh, lang i mean legalese language that is rooted in the legal which is sometimes unintelligible to many of us right i mean it's not something that we are very familiar with 
So when we think of policies like that, we often have an expert who interprets policy for us, which is why you have a number of policy analysts, you have think tanks and you have policy spaces, policy houses, where people interpret government stances, government vision for a particular sector, and they tell us and analyze uh, it for us in various ways, using various prisms and using various lenses and perspectives. But what I'm trying to do today is to demystify this policy space and to see how each of you is a policy actor. You may not be a policy maker. You may not be part of that, those official meetings where policy making happens, but this is to sort of um, enable you to see yourself as a policy actor because at the end of the day, all of us in our everyday life implement or carry forward or are at the receiving end sometimes, or if we have the agency, even shape policies from the ground up, from the bottom up, right? So the, the idea today is to recognize ourselves as policy actors, whether we are active policy actors or passive ones, and to see how we can study policy beyond, uh, I mean, of course, an institutional approach is important, but it's also important to go beyond in the structures of institutions to, uh, to see how policy operates in the everyday, right? And um, towards this end, let me just uh, share my screen. I'll give you a little bit of a background to this research and how you can conduct a critical policy ethnography. Why is it even needed? And, why, and how you can go about conducting this through two examples from my own research. Um, I'm just trying to share the screen. Sorry. Yeah, the screen is shared, I think. I'm just trying to... Uh... Okay. So this is visible, right? So um, uh, the topic of the day is critical policy ethnography, why and how. So let me begin by um, talking a little bit, taking you back and perhaps drawing on the previous lecture, which all of you have already been, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, listening to, to draw on the theoretical location of such a project of a critical policy ethnography, right? So the intellectual leanings of critical policy ethnography is located at the intersections of two broad areas of research. The first being radical international relations theory, and the second being media anthropology, both of which I have abiding interest in. And that's why, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I was bringing these two interests of mine to conceptualize this particular way of conducting policy research. So what about radical IR theory am I talking about? So radical IR theory, sorry about the spelling there, is a departure from the traditional undertakings of the discipline. It focuses on embracing the various transitions and paths over almost a century now in, uh, in, uh, and more taken by the uh, theories of the social sciences. And this, you, I mean, you just got introduced to critical theorizing and feminist thought and feminist approaches. I would include post-colonial thought, um, anti-racist thought, um, and now critical caste studies, all these, uh, this ambit of uh, critical perspectives that look at emancipation of the human being at, uh, that place the emancipation of the human being at the center. The idea of theory is not just to ruminate and to make things intelligible, but it is also to make things, to change things, right? And uh, th this particular project that is radical IR theory is very much located in that ambit of changing things for the better to emancipate the human being from various structures of oppression, various structures of power that are operational in society along various intersectional lines, right? I mean, you of course have patriarchy, um, you have, uh, I mean, you have religion, caste, class, um, uh, region as various markers of how various structures of uh, power get consolidated and become entrenched over time. And the idea of radical IR theory is not just to observe the world, but also to bring experiential understandings from our everyday experiences to change the world for the better and to emancipate the human. So having laid that down, uh, the second idea that informs my research and informs this approach to policy studies 
is located in the third uh, debate, what is called the third great debate in international relations, where the focus was between on this tussle or this paradigm, inter-paradigm war between the positivists and the post-positivists. Uh, in the previous session, ma'am had kindly alluded to the difference between quantitative research and qualitative research and how uh, experience plays such an important role in the latter. This is drawing from that very strand of thought where positivism is about um, making the world, uh, po positivists believe that you could attain reality. You could attain reality, you could make it intelligible, you could devise methods which are rooted in statistics and quantitative research in order to make it intelligible uh, to the human being, to the human mind. Whereas the post-positivist said that reality might be there. However, uh, attaining it is dependent on the location that you are operational in, your perspectives and stances, the lens and the perspectives with which um, you uh, operate and it need not necessarily draw on quantitative research. It places subjectivity. It places subjectivity, human subjectivity at the center. And therefore, this is very much, you know, a paradigm debate between objectivity, objective approaches and subjective approaches to research. Right. So post positivism in that vein, it recognizes difference because it really depends on the researcher as to what lens or what approach or what stance they choose. And that's what post-positivism does. It offers fertile ground for the conduct of what is called a critical policy ethnography, which I will be elaborating uh, further ahead. So like I mentioned, um, uh, having drawn on these strands of uh, radical IR theory, uh, the third debate between uh, the inter-paradigm debate between positivists and post-positivists, it becomes important to see where you can locate ethnography. So what is ethnography? Ethnography is nothing but an anthropological approach. Um, it looks at how anthropology's offerings can be uh, drawn on to make sense of the world. It's a qualitative approach which comprises ethnography itself as an umbrella. It's not one particular method, which is why I'm calling it an approach because it comprises various methods under that umbrella. The first being uh, participant observation, which is very important to ethnography. The second being interviewing. The third uh, being various other complementary methods which go with qualitative research, like uh, conducting focus group discussions or conducting archival work, for instance. The combination of ethnographic research and archival work can lead to very, very interesting kind of insights. So this is the larger umbrella in which we are operating. And uh, the second uh, sort of group of, uh, pro, um, I mean, subject area that I'm drawing on is media anthropology. Now, media anthropology is specifically anthropology of communication and media. With media technology so, uh, becoming so, I mean, imperative today, um, I, mean, it's, I mean, we've had so many inventions over time from uh, the telegraph and the radio to television to the in coming of the internet um, and various other digital technologies today, the mobile, uh, that, I mean, our lives are so intricately connected to the media and its technologies in various ways that it becomes very, very difficult to not um, encounter it in our research. I mean, all of us in some ways draw on some aspect of media research in our own work be it in the form of newspaper reportage and clippings and, uh, you know, uh, newspaper editorials, for instance, analyzing them as secondary data to using various other kinds of uh, spaces, web uh, uh, sources, for instance. So media technologies have altered the face of research and have become an important subject of research. And therefore using, bringing that together in the study or in the qualitative study of media becomes very, very important. And using ethnography to do that because it gives a subjective understanding of the ways in which people interact, interpret and associate with the media. That allows you to understand how media plays out in the everyday lives of people. Right. So this is uh, these are the broad uh, two subject areas that is radical IR theory and media anthropology that I'm drawing on in order to conceptualize something called critical policy ethnography. 
Now, uh, many of you may be familiar with ethnography's origins. It was a very, it was very much a colonial enterprise. It was part of the colonizers' mission to go to these remote tribal areas or islands and document the lives of these people whom they uh, measured, whose lives and whose living habits, whose appearances were measured in colon in a very colonial fashion. They were measured on. uh you know on along the lines of the colonizer which were the european powers uh for instance the the skin tone or the features of the uh, people that they were studying their height their weight these the the emergence of eugenics for instance as a science all of this has its origins in a colonial ethnography and a colonial anthropology and um it becomes very important especially in today's times when we are talking about the decolonial in so many ways we are talking about decolonizing research what does that even mean it's become a fa fad and a fashion to talk about it but in order to conduct research which is truly decolonial which is rooted in decolonial thought which is rooted in decolonial practice uh, it's very very important to bring in that critical element to it and that's what i will be illustrating through the course of what critical policy ethnography is now anand pandian has spoken about how ethnography in particular as a way of studying the human consciously devoid of its colonial beginnings and by submitting it to a decolonizing project offers rigor and excitement at being able to capture the nuances of human interaction he is making a case to strip ethnography and anthropology of its colonial beginnings to subject it and submit it to a decolonizing project when one does that one is able to use ethnography you know for various various purposes which are rooted in the emancipation of the human being therefore the idea is not to discard ethnography because it of its colonial beginnings but to rescue it using the decolonial project and to implement it in our everyday research in our own research projects in in ways that um enhance uh, you know the qualitative research that we conduct uh, the idea is to be very conscious and reflexive of our own positions our own location in society the uh, structures that we are part of but the stru structures that we sort of inhabit in various ways but also promote in various ways subconsciously it's it's important to be reflexive of that in order to strip ethnography of its colonial operations right um here ali and herzog talk about the lack of reflexive methodology methodological scholarship in media policy studies and media policy research and suggest that it is the need of the r and therefore drawing on these two kind of um, arguments i suggest and i talk about policy ethnography as a methodology i will come to the critical aspect of it but what is policy ethnography like i mentioned uh when we think of policy we think of people sitting in the ministries you know ias officers or ministers joint secretaries of various ministerial departments sitting in their chambers and making policy signing off on these important policy documents all the same we think of corporate boardrooms where industrialists sit and prepare various policies that impact people's lives in various ways i mean all these uh, situations are of course probable but in order to rescue policy and to bring it from a top down policy approach to a bottom up policy approach ethnography can be deployed to do that and therefore policy ethnography allows for engagement with policy making from the ground up as opposed to top down policy straight jackets uh, how does one do that here in the case of a policy conducting a policy ethnography the researcher embeds himself or herself in venues of policy making which cut across dichotomies of formal informal virtual real government non government and i'll let you i'll tell you what this means in other words if you are a researcher who's conducting a policy ethnography you start off firstly by embedding yourself in locations where policy is being made and these venues of policy making need not only be government or corporate spaces of course they are also important but it could be informal spaces as well 
and i will draw on my research to give you an example of how i went about conducting such a study it could also cut across the dichotomies of virtual and real especially during the pandemic if you've been following the personal uh, data protection bill um, or the non personal data space both of which i'll be talking about again a little bit which i'm uh, sort of conducting research on in both these cases you saw that the government and various other actually various other policies a lot of virtual consultations were happening a lot of the policy work was happening online on zoom calls because because of the uh, nature of the situation right now and because of the pandemic a lot of the policy making has moved online right and stakeholder consultations are happening online in such a scenario it would be a travesty to not examine the virtual space as a key space for policy making similarly it's not just the government officials who make policy i ask all of you to imagine yourselves as policy actors so today when an aadhar card does not work when because the biometrics are not working you are somebody who is interfacing with the policy of the government to ma- make uh, aadhar useful for any pro- you know process that's in place right you are very much interacting with the government's policy and therefore whether it's working or not whether it's uh, you know a successful policy or not just the, you're part of that policy cycle you're part of those policy spaces and you're very much a very active policy uh, actor in that case right so in order to the first step is to like i said embed yourself in venues of policy making and um, this uh, ethnography policy ethnography allows you to go beyond technocratic policy making and reduces the democratic gap that's what dubois who uh, says he's conducted research on welfare policies in france and he talks about how through an ethnography by not just re- you know reducing policy studies to a document but by going and talking to people whose uh, lives are impacted by this policy people who make these policies by understanding the politics of policy making one is able to reduce the democratic gap you are able to bring people closer to the policy process right so um why is ethnography important in this case ethnography is important because it allows you to dwell on individual and group interactions right uh, very often i mean in anthropological studies you talk about kinship you talk about communities and um i mean this is the tussle between um i mean i don't want to caricature it as east and west but a liberal ethos and a communitarian ethos i mean the tussle is always between the individual and the group but ethnography allows you to examine both the individual and the group because when you go and conduct interviews semi structured conversations and interviews with people to draw on their experiences of policy you are documenting an individual's experience with policy similarly when you are observing people through participant observations or focus group discussions you are looking at their group interactions you are looking at structures of power for instance i mean when i was conducting uh, you know research in one of the rural areas in up and mp you would always see certain people sitting at a higher level elevated level and some others sitting at the ground level that allows you to immediately think of structures of power the dynamics of power in a group setting who are the people who call the shots in a community and allows you to investigate those aspects that's of course a small example similarly uh, and i'll come to my research in a bit but for instance when i was visiting bangladesh or sri lanka for that matter to these government offices to study broadcasting to talk to officers who are in the broadcasting departments uh ministries of information and broadcasting whatever the local uh, name for each of these ministries are you could see how their filing cabinets were arranged how the files move from one desk to another what is the process it takes for a policy making uh, you know initiative to you know what is the process like so these are all aspects that uh, allow you to understand individual dynam- uh, you know power structures uh, i mean that an individual is located in or is wielding and the group interactions and group dynamics so ethnography allows you to do that in a very very wonderful way 
it helps unravel power relations individual policy actor dispositions and it also allows you to understand certain universal norms for instance uh, i mean let's take the example of i mean something that we are just we've just been familiar with just the idea of women empowerment we just looked at how certain indices do not um, indicate women empowerment right i mean uh, universally you might have certain like for instance uh, i mean a un body might prescribe certain indices to indicate that women empowerment has happened but at the ground level realities are very different and individual uh, uh, experiences and group dynamics for example in various parts of india might be very different i mean given the urban peri urban rural continuum there are so many factors that play into uh, creating these dynamics of interactions so in such a case universal norms and their interpretation and experience by people on ground are there is often a, a disconnect just to understand that as part of the study of policy becomes very very important and ethnography allows you to do that now let me turn my attention to the critical aspect of critical policy ethnography i mean when we say something is critical what do we mean it does not mean that we are constantly critical i mean as the term might suggest in a very direct way it's not that we are constantly uh, negative about something when we say that we are critical about something it means that we use a critical lens to study structures of power that keep people the way they are we are able to locate certain uh, i mean instead of buying into the larger narrative we are able to look at in localized experiences in order to challenge these narratives we are able to bring various facets and various experiences to illuminate various perspectives in relation to a policy issue at hand so when we say uh, critical we mean that it is an egalitarian project rooted in public interest it is rooted in an emancipatory project right like we mentioned uh, the role of critical theory for instance has been rooted in eman emancipatory politics and that's what this particular research draws on right so ethnography like i mentioned it allows you to draw on individual and group interactions it helps in questioning the predominance of a single source of power and policy so it's not that we are looking to the government for policy it helps you recognize the multiple stakeholders you as a stakeholder activists and advocates of a policy as a stakeholder people uh, who are involved directly in negotiating with structures of power looking at them as stakeholders that becomes important so when we uh, today when we talk about a forest rights act we recognize that the people whose land belongs to them in various tribal areas we recognize them as stakeholders if we are to use the lens of a critical policy ethnography we do not only recognize a vedanta you know as you know a policy actor and only call them to the negotiating table but we call the tribes of niyamgiri to the table as well to the negotiation table as well so that is what a critical policy ethnography does it helps disrupt structures of power helps open up the black box of policy making to recognize various policy actors including the people who are affected by it on a daily basis by recognizing them as stakeholders what you are essentially doing is that you are spreading the sources of power among these people you're giving them the power the negotiating power sorry about that instead of going by a centralized uh, uh, idea of power behind any of the policy moves right the finally the critical aspect comes in when one conceptualizes one's methodology and method to be decolonial and in going beyond the dominant paradigm the dominant paradigm has always suggested that it's always top down power flows in a top down fashion but when the minute you decolonize and any research enterprise you are immediately able to identify the agency in people to bring about change at the local level but also at the national level regional level whatever you know various levels that and you are able to recognize that you are able to shine light on it and bring that under the lens right so that's what the critical 
aspect of critical policy ethnography is all about now i'll be moving to two sort of practicum uh, two case studies or two sets of examples to illustrate how a critical policy ethnography can be conducted the first uh, instance draws on my doctoral research which is now in the form of a book um what how i mean i'll talk a little bit about how i went about conducting this critical policy ethnography during the course of this research um the first uh, instance is i started with a mapping exercise it's not one of those sophisticated visual maps that you use software to generate but simply an exercise in understanding who are the various policy actors who are the various networks of people in power and not in power so by diffusing this central idea of one policy actor you are immediately opening up uh, the lens to identify various policy actors so uh, these actors and networks had different degrees of power and autonomy like i mentioned they cut across dichotomies of informal and formal across the regional local regional national global levels so this is the continuum one talks about similarly i was looking at various venues of policy making i was a, i mean the idea was to map all these things because once you have it in paper or you know on the computer in using whatever it could just be a word document it could be you know something where you just have sort you know map relations between people between actors and networks between venues like popular platforms and forums physical and virtual spaces of negotiation for policies etc similarly you can identify the processes involved for example every for instance if you have to apply for an rti there is a formal process involved you have to go to this particular office or you can do it online whatever it is you have to email a particular person or you have to fill out a form you can apply for it in a particular way similarly for what i was studying which is broadcasting policy there is a particular way in which licenses are applied right i mean there are numerous ministries involved it's not only the ministry of information and broadcasting but to give the license clearance you'll have a ministry of home affairs who will do a background check of the people who are applying for licenses you know and categorize them as safe in order to hold a license so you have that ministry you have the mosit uh, which is the ministry of um, communication and information technology which takes care of the spectrum allocation plan etc for broadcasting because i was looking at community radio broadcasting and for that you need allocation of spectrum right so these are all the formal processes of applying for policies when it comes to informal uh, processes you can look at how negotiation happens in india you had uh, you had a movement for community radio similarly in nepal sri lanka was one of the pioneers in community radio in the late 1970s and 80s in bangladesh you had a movement for community radio so these movements people's movements how they negotiate how they build solidarity what are the strategies how do they operate from the ground up how do they advocate for a policy change right so all these would go into processes similarly you have interests and normative concerns so in there you map out for instance if it's a corporate actor for instance if it is a red fm who is interested in the same spectrum that a small community radio station in the vicinity of its operation maybe in gurgaon in gurgaon you have something called gurgaon ki awaaz which works with migrant labor and that community and makes programs for them radio programs for them so if red fm in operating in ncr has a problem with gurgaon ki awaaz which is a very smaller much smaller in scale but uh, but they have they have to access the same spectrum because spectrum is uh, at least by the uh, official logic is limited right and it can be allocated only to a few players so immediately whose interests gain upper hand how are they lobbying for it how are they contacting certain people in the ministries to make a case for their own business or their own initiative their own entity so what are the premises so uh, for instance a gurgaon ki awaaz will put forth a normative premise saying we are catering to certain disadvantaged communities we are catering to the migrant community right so what are the various standpoints in, from which these um, actors make a case for their own interests 
what are the norms that are governing their behavior what are the normative elements that are specific to something called community radio and how do the, all of this play out in the negotiations this is something that i was looking at similarly mapping and reviewing media policies that impact community radio one is of course the community radio policy but for instance which is governed by the broadcasting policy of a country right but at the same time if you have internet radio i mean if you have a community radio which is also broad, uh, streaming on the internet does the it law play a role in it or is it the broadcasting act which is which will play a role in it similarly you have the copyright act you have the intellectual property rights act you have the spectrum allocation plan so with for every policy you will see that there is an ecosystem of other policies which impinge on its functioning and this is just an example of course you can take any policy uh, you know uh, whatever policies whether it's for girl child empowerment whatever it is social policies social security measures you will see that it never operates in isolation you will have other policies which impact its functioning but it's never seen that way it's never seen as an ecosystem of policies so this mapping exercise also helped me understand the larger ecosystem of various policies working with each other and then you have the geographical mapping of regions within countries where policies work differently so you may all know that for instance in delhi ncr policies work very differently compared to a far flung region where like for instance in the northeast of india or policies like in kashmir you've had internet shutdowns right so policies for the internet work differently as an example work differently in various areas of the country so there are reasons for it and you'll have official versions you will have localized experiences you will have activists having their own kind of points that they make so just understanding the geographical mapping of regions and the politics of that became very very important similarly statistical mapping of licenses granted etc mapping of the i mean in all of this uh because i was studying four countries of south asia that is india nepal sri lanka and bangladesh it became very important for me to understand the larger socio economic political and cultural context as well as the media ecology in which this particular thing that i was studying was located in right in other words each of these countries has had a colonial common past barring nepal nepal had a, what is called a crypto colonial past because it was never under british rule directly but it had trade relations with the british the, the rana monarchy of nepal had trade relations with the british and therefore their administrative setups mirrored the british government's administrative administrative setups and as you know this was one larger landmass at that point which is modern day south asia uh, so given the common colonial past you see that the administrative setups have some kind of commonality in each of these countries having said that in the last 70 plus years you see that each of these countries have taken various very very divergent trajectories economically socially politically culturally as well right if they have their own ethos they have their own political setups so it's important to recognize that and it's important to study that in depth and also study the media ecology in depth in order to understand in what space are we operating in what context are we operating so the contextual attributes become very very important and finally it becomes important to study that sector in which i mean that particular sector do a historical study of that sector to understand where it stands today what is the history like right and to uh, ensure that you get an understanding like a holistic understanding basically of the trajectory that that particular sector has taken uh, the policies of which you are study so that was the mapping exercise this took me quite a few months to conduct for four countries and then what i did but it gave me a lot of background understanding and information before i can actually before i could go to these countries and do the ethnography the second aspect is conceptualizing what are called deliberative sites as you know policy making is not a process where you just sign on a document there are discussions happening around every policy even if it's at the ministry level if it's at the you know a citizens forum these are all deliberative sites because deliberations on policy happens so when you conduct an ethnography 
it becomes important to embed yourselves in these deliberative sites and conduct an ethnography of how these conversations are happening so you might not have access to the ministry uh, and their deliberations but you can always have access to these informal spaces where citizens groups meet or activists meet where advocates of a policy stance meet um uh, i mean civil society basically how where they congregate and how they negotiate those spaces are very very rich as ethnographic deliberative sites to study policy making so i mean the ethnography for me in my case comprised uh, observations field notes formal in depth interviews informal conversations and i conducted an ethnography over 3 years in each of these i mean together for 3 years covering these four countries so the key deliberative sites in the case of my research were prominent policy making avenues in the capital cities of the countries being studied including including consultative meetings organized by the government seminars and conferences that brought together key actors involved in negotiating for community radio policies spaces for discussion and deliberation created by ngos and advocacy networks digital spaces that provide archival data for instance a mailing list right uh, you will have a mailing list where people will you know uh, activists will uh, uh, sort of have updates about government policies and they will have discussions about the next course of action how it impacts the sector etc so those digital mailing list serves all of that was very very important material and all of that uh, contributed to the form uh, you know the designation of what are called deliberative sites for policy making so just to give you an example um, who are the actors by actors i mean policy actors who are the people i've interviewed uh, this includes formal interviews and informal conversations so i looked at former and current bureaucrats working with the ministries of communication information and broadcasting and home affairs uh, actors that make up what are called the epistemic communities with respect to community radio where like bodies like the community radio forum community radio association of india the sri lanka development journalists forum the bangladesh network of ngos in radio and communication the association of community radio broadcasters of nepal these were some of the bodies citizens bodies and advocacy groups that i had studied the next is representatives of international organizations like amak which is the world association for community radio broadcasters un bodies like unesco unicef other intergovernmental multilateral donor agencies like ims or internews etc i also spoke to researchers and observers studying the sector i spoke to media law and technology law experts i also spoke and visited a number of community radio stations to understand how uh, i mean their experiences with operationalizing uh, the national policies at the station level because you know once the policy is made at the end of the day it is these stations who are running the stations who are making sure that a policy is operationalized at the ground level so what are their experiences like what, what is the gap between you know a nationally imagined policy and what happens at that ground level so and also the second group of people were people who were denied licenses who how does the state decide whom to give licenses to and whom not to give licenses to which communities are considered okay to be given the license to and which ones are considered blacklisted so those just understanding the politics of licensing all of that became important uh, for my study so how did i go about doing the sampling and interviews firstly for the sampling i connect, connected with some key policy actors and then i went to each of these countries i wrote them emails i went to each of these countries and through them through snowball sampling i met a range of other people so it was very much like um very action packed in the sense that i just landed in these countries without too much of a background except for the background research that i had conducted through that mapping process and un understanding the scene etc but it was very much about going to those countries as a rank stranger contacting one or two people and then through snowball sampling asking them for more people and connecting from them to other people so just ensuring that the entire landscape including contrarian views are covered 
so i was very very conscious of the divides in the community in the community radio sectors because some people would have a particular group and then there would be other group just like it happens in every sector so it was important to capture the debate and the tussle and the negotiations um and the dramatic kind of conversations between various groups so i was very conscious of the politics of the civil society as well in each of these countries um in depth semi structured interviews were conducted with questionnaires that were tailor made for each kind of policy actor so like i mentioned in the previous slide some of them were government officials some of them were civil society groups some of them were uh, representatives of international organizations so for each kind of policy actor came up with you know a list of questions and uh, broad i mean i had some broad thematic entry points so that i could understand how each policy actor was and i operationalized those thematic entry points as questions for each policy actor um and then i had some background information on each of these policy actors like the history of the organizations they work for etc in order to get some understanding before i went and met them and conducted the interviews um so basically uh, the idea was to give a holistic picture of the policy making process um i was very very conscious of my own location and this is in the vein of uh, reflexivity which is so important in conducting decolonial ethnographic research i am somebody who is a young female researcher from south india going to each of these places i mean india acts as a big brother in the region because these are smaller countries and india is seen as a hegemon and i did not want to i was very conscious of the politics and the diplomatic relations between india and the other countries because you know i, I mean as much as one thinks once of oneself as citizen of the world you are still carrying certain identity markers and it's important to be conscious of that and to be reflexive of it when you conduct research so this is the second kind of uh, research that i'm this is an ongoing project that i'm doing this has been after my book was published and the post phd so the contours of this research is more digital in nature because of the nature of the times that we are in which is the pandemic and i've been conducting digital ethnography uh, i mean on uh, and of course i hope to translate that into real time ethnography as well uh, on data governance in india i'm looking at how so in data governance you have again two broad umbrellas one is personal data protection and the other is non personal data so i'm looking at how governance is i mean policy making is happening how governance is being actualized in these two spaces uh, india recently passed and tabled and passed the personal data protection bill right and this will impact each of us as individuals and as researchers so it's very very important to be aware of the data laws that are currently being um, sort of brought in in india and uh, so for this purpose i've been conducting a digital ethnography with two groups on two messenger apps one whatsapp group and one telegram group <coughs> uh, i mean for the sake of convenience i'm anonymizing it of course let's call the whatsapp group world and the telegram group purpose so i took permissions from the moderators and the group members of both these groups in order to embed myself because these are groups that are constantly having conversations around these two uh, i mean especially on these media technology uh, policy making that's happening for instance uh, this particular whatsapp group called world which is now actually migrated to signal so um, what they are doing is they have a lot of updates they publish or they share policy papers and they have a lot of updates on what's happening in the government what kind of a policy move is the government coming up with etc so i keep getting my updates from there and with the telegram group this group was actually formed in order to resist aadhar so it has a history of resisting government uh, uh, i mean uh, enumeration programs like the aadhar right which is a biometric um, uh, i mean you all know that it's the identity uh, card that they are giving and based on biometrics so they have been opposing that and it's a civil society group so i embedded myself in these two uh, digital sites and i've conducted telephonic interviews with people again because of the pandemic i've attended a lot of webinars and policy sessions including those 
who were part of uh, people including by people who are part of the chris gopala krishnan committee of the non personal data uh, governance uh, uh, report uh, these uh, webinars and policy sessions were conducted by media nama the dialogue uh, policy think tanks various policy think tanks in this space um i've also done some popular writing uh, i've done a couple of presentations to this telegram group members of this group where we were dissecting so it's i'm very much a participant observer i'm still participating in the conversations uh, i'm just not a detached observer because i have you know a stake in the policy right because i'm not only a detached researcher but i'm also somebody who's very passionate about media policy and i have i have a background of being a researcher in that space so i come with a certain amount of knowledge in relation to the policy issue at hand and therefore i have been involved in making presentations to these groups etc so in that context i've been doing some popular writing in the form of writing for blogs institutional blogs some of which has been published so this is an ongoing project where i'm taking what i started off in terms of conducting a critical policy ethnography and i'm translating that through time i mean uh, because of the uh, the uh, conditions of the times that we are in most of it has been a digital component but this is a great turn that it's taking and this is an observable discernible turn that uh, the digital aspect of ethnography is gaining a lot of prominence and it's about time that those of us who are interested in ethnography embrace it so these are some of the scholars who have been talking about digital ethnography they are very famous deborah lapton uh, sara pink and john postel so these are media anthropologists technologists who talk about digital ethnography and their works are very very key to understanding digital ethnography <clears throat> i'll just wrap up my presentation by saying that the path ahead especially for policy studies is in understanding that the policy process itself is becoming digitalized right and the pandemic has accelerated it it's not something that we can wish away so it's important that we recognize that and how and our quest is and as we know there's a huge digital divide in spite of you know the penetration of the internet in india there is a huge digital divide especially of people accessing these policy conversations there's hardly any conversation around it in the mainstream media as well right it's only in certain pockets that people who are interested people from think tanks and policy spaces are interacting with these kinds of con uh, ideas and conversations and therefore it it is absolutely important for us to ensure that we focus on critical policy literacy among the people people ought to know what ha is happening in terms of policy development what are they signing up for when a government comes up with a data governance plan for the country what is it what parts of their freedom is being given in how do they negotiate it with the state these are all things that need to be spoken about and uh, critical policy ethnography allows you to do that it allows you to go down to the level of the people and bring, make people the center of the policy process and all of this is what would contribute to that emancipatory project that people who spoke about critical theory envisaged how do you operationalize for today it for today's times is actually through this by being very aware of the kinds of um, governance structures that are uh, being put in place and we can't see ourselves merely as subjects we need to see ourselves as active policy actors in order to be able to negotiate and make space for our views and to tailor our experiences the way we uh, deem it right and deem it fit for ourselves so with that i'll end this talk and uh, i'll be happy to take any questions more questions on um the research or uh, you know any aspects of uh, conducting a policy ethnography through a critical lens thank you dr uh, priti raghunath ma'am for such an informative erudite exposition of the policy making process highlighting its uh, co constructive nature uh, dispelling the dominant understanding that the uh, policy and policy making is an expert led activity so if time permits uh, may maybe you can take few questions and uh, may I request my colleagues to read out questions put up in the 
chat maybe oh. couple of question yeah hello hello sir uh um, hello ma'am uh we have we are already like uh, uh, we are already looking late for the next session so we will not be able to take too many questions i guess uh so for that we will what we will do we will take only two questions right now and then uh, rest of the questions that come to us we will email to you and we will request you to kindly respond us back and we will share that with uh, our uh, audience participate Oops. so yeah. i will read this there is a this long question like three part question that i am going through uh, so and and i am quoting this is from divya janardhan if i am uh, pronouncing her name right good session preeti thanks three queries from my side one a question not so much of method but of the social worlds in or off policy the mode of doing critical policy ethnography that you are advocating will only work in a given political and social conditions in many regions as well as for contentious policies there is a simply no space for us as ethnographers or even as members of the public to enter and participate in policy making uh, i'm sure you have encountered such problems of access and entry as an anthropologist if not as a citizen how have you handled such moments this is one part this is one question uh you want me to read another question because like this is long if you want to answer this question first then you can okay go. i'll perhaps i'll address this question first i mean it i mean one of the key aspects of uh, any kind of ethnographic work is that you have to build your way into things you have to build relations with the people that you want to study uh you have to i mean ensuring access is the main concern because if we all had access then i mean conducting research would be easier but having said that uh, and recognizing the difficulty of it i would still say that it's not impossible because um especially um <coughs> sorry especially because um if you are able to conduct that mapping exercise if you are able to identify the people that you want to speak to chasing them i mean this is something that uh, you develop either as a journalist or as a researcher chasing people to ensure that you get their perspective explaining it to them as to why this research is important and explaining it to them as to what is your stance and what is your position in relation to the research that you are conducting um, i mean how does it how um, especially if it's people centric there is a larger public interest mandate to doing this kind of work and uh, sort of elaborating on that and explaining that to people that you want to study or you know interview or work with that's the first step secondly i mean just to give you an instance from my field work uh, i mean like i mentioned as an indian and i'm somebody who is of a certain ling i have a certain linguistic background like all of us do and uh, visiting sri lanka just in the post war period and having a certain linguistic background made it very difficult for me because i knew i was being monitored and tracked and um, made it very difficult for me to access government spaces and conduct uh, research in policy spaces but um, i mean i think it's about being smart and having good intentions and i mean that comes with the reflexivity if you are able to convince the other person access might not always be possible in ministerial spaces and government spaces but the idea is to not give up and to develop relations with people because at the end of the day these ministers and officials are also human beings and when convinced that you're not there to constantly interrogate them but you're trying to understand so if you can do that i think half the battle is won of course you will find certain blocks but um, it's not impossible one can always push the ambit push the envelope a little bit through our own efforts and that's what we can hope to do okay uh, thank you for explaining that uh, another part of this question it is uh, uh, her only second question is an empirical inquiry how has the pandemic affected the spatial and temporal horizons of policy making for instance has it further reduced the duration of public participation and is virtual space likely to trump as the venue of stakeholder meetings as well as for the ethnographers of policy this is the second question do you yeah know? Uh, unfortunately um should i answer this no 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 i just wanted to like if you want me to repeat the question or like you can no 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 uh, i've got the question uh, i was saying that unfortunately 
it is the virtual spaces which have emerged as spaces of policy making and uh, which is why i highlighted that critical policy literacy by people like us who have access to these spaces i mean all of us have access to the calls put forth by you know an entity like media nama which tracks technology policy but also other spaces created by civil society organizations to discuss various policy uh, initiatives and various policy moves it's people like us who need to go take that uh, those discussions to the people we need to i mean it can't be even today with all the digitization that's happening and digital india etc i mean we all know how stark the digital divide is and uh, we are talking about not just access but literacy we are talking about critical literacy about policies um and therefore when something as specialized as data governance is being uh, i mean it's being done at that level in a massive way and if the way it is going to affect our lives in very very intricate ways it's important that we make that we act as those translators because we have the access we have the know how and we can educate ourselves so um, unfortunately it has reduced public participation but it also puts the onus on us as researchers to emerge not just as detached researchers but activist researchers in some sense uh there is another third third part of the question uh, from divya janathan only has it been easy to generalize from your specific field of inquiry which is media policies in south asia and speak of policy making processes as such this is yeah thank you um i wouldn't say that because i mean the key part of an ethnography is to retain the particularities and the specificities it's very important that we don't make larger broad stroke kind of um uh, big uh, kind of claims having said that it will uh, i mean the iterative process so after the ethnography i also use the methodology of constructivist grounded theory to build the deliberative policy ecology approach there because you're constantly dealing with the data and you're generating theory from data it's an iterative process you're constantly coding or you're constantly generating uh, in vivo codes and you're moving towards abstraction so while generalization of the policy process itself is not possible you're able to come up with some kind of um, an abstracted view of how policy making might occur in south asia like a slightly abstracted view but the idea is to not lose the the intricacies of the particular uh, particularities and the specificities that the field has to offer that your field site has to offer uh, thank you i guess uh, yeah i think we are really running short of time and we would have about to take further questions so before i uh, wrap up this session i uh, i would like to extend my sincere gratitude to dr preeti ragnath ma'am for sparing her valuable time to enlighten us ma'am we are really looking forward to have more sessions with you on some other events thank you so much again for being with us thank you so much thank you thank you preeti thank you so much dr mansi and dr wasim and dr pratyush and everybody here uh, i hope all of you stay safe and have a wonderful time through this sm I uh, just want to uh, ask Basim uh, sir, we have shared feedback form. Uh, yeah, we have already done that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, looking forward to uh, see you soon, Preeti. Yeah, take care. Bye bye. Thank you.